Give me a thumbs up. Okay, cool. So what it is that you have is a five volt source with a switch with a one K ohm resistor and a capacitor. The moment we close this switch, things start to happen. What starts to happen? Well, the capacitor starts to charge. And ultimately, how far will it charge up to? Will it charge? It, it should charge only up as high as the voltage source, five volts in this case, uh, allows it to charge. The five volt source is the limit to which the capacitor can charge. It can charge no more than five volts. Once it charges up to five volts, it stops charging. Uh, there will be no more current flow. So what we're going to be observing with this exercise, what you're going to be doing with this exercise, is uh, learning how to um, calculate uh, how the capacitor and the resistor behaves. I'm going to give you a different circuit that we will work out right now, okay? So I'm going to change my view off this share and go to the camera view. And on camera view, here we go. So we have a, I have a pen here. We have a circuit that's charging. I'm gonna change the parameters because I'm not gonna do your homework for you. Here's a switch and I will put in a capacitor. And let's say this capacitor is a number three, four, four. Okay, and this is a resistor, and let's say this resistor is a brown, red, red, silver at maximum. So it's a good for us to start reviewing some practice items with respect to um, our final exam coming up. We have a four resistor color code. It is coded at maximum. So you have to interpret each of these color bands and then calculate what the maximum will be. So since this is a four band resistor, first band is indicative of what part of the value. This would be the first digit. What is brown? Throw it out there. It's a one, good. And red would be a what? Would be a two. And then the third band represents what information? Is it our third digit? No, it represents, thank you, EJ, number of zeros. Can you all see each other in the little, um, no, you can't. <laughs> anyway, the number of zeros. So we have two zeros followed by omega and then plus or minus. Then the fourth band tells you what? Tolerance, yes? And what is the tolerance if it's silver? It's a one and a zero, one zero. It's interesting. You're all going one zero like this, but on my side of the screen, it looks like a zero one, <laughs> right? <laughs> it would be one zero the way you're looking at the screen. Yes, it's funny. Anyway, plus or minus 10%. So uh, that, let me go back to um, speaker view so we can see this enlarged. So, and this is at maximum. So that means we're gonna multiply this by what multiplier? The multiplier will be 1.1, yes? So go ahead and take 1200 and multiply by 1.1 right now. <clears throat> 1200 times 1.1, and we calculate 1.32 K ohms, yes? 1,220, which is 1.32 K ohms. So this is equal to the R. Now, you are given a three-digit code for the capacitor. How do we decode capacitors? Well, there was a method by which we do that. For the cap, for the cap, which is number 344, the first digit is uh, first value. So the digit happens to be the three. So the first value we write down is a three. The second digit is equal to the second value. And that happens to be a four. I'll write down four. The third digit of a capacitor code represents what information? What do you remember? 
unmute your mic and tell me what what I see. I see a bunch of I see a bunch of zeros. Yes, number of zeros. Okay, and how many zeros am I going to write down after the three and the four? Four zeros. One, two, three, four. And what do I have to follow this by? There's a very specific value I have to follow this by, and that would be what? Pico. Picofarads. Picofarads. And if you punch that into your calculator, you punch this into your calculator, you have three, four, one, two, three, four zeros, and then you do your exponent negative. Pico is what power of 10? This is uh, 10 negative 12, yes? So I have a E negative 12, hit enter, and it turns out to be 340 nanofarads. Yes, is according to engineering notation, it would be 340 nanofarads. Now, we already said that this is not a correct standard for reading capacitors. Capacitors are only stated in what units? Farads, microfarads, or picofarads. There are no millifarads, there are no um, nanofarads. These are the only standardized values. So technically, we should restate this guy as being 0.34 microfarads. Because if you key in 0.34 micro, I'm sorry, you can't see that. If you, if you key in 0.34 micro into your calculator, you'll get 340 nano. Watch this. I'm going to clear 0.34 exponent negative 6. There's your 34 uh, 0.34 micro. The moment I hit enter, I should see 340 nano. Do I see 340 nano? They are the same. All right, so we'll just use what's convenient for us on our calculators. Now, the very first thing this exercise asks you to do, it tells you there's something here called tau, T-A-U, with this symbol, looks like a cursive T, is called time constant. And what is the time constant? It's the amount of time, in what units, seconds, that a capacitor takes to charge 63.2% of the remaining charge value. So given that tau is equal to R times C, calculate one tau. So one tau would calculate tau T is equal to TAU, and that would calculate to be R times C. And this in turn would be 1.32K multiplied by 340 nanofarads. So everybody try that. That would be 1.32 exponent, k is 3. And we're going to multiply this by 340 exponent negative 9. So those are your keys. And I am looking for a calculation. I will go ahead and do this while somebody shouts me out an answer. Okay, exponent 3 times 340. Second exponent negative nine. Boop. All right. Who's got an answer for me? All right. Oh, Robert, what do you have? 448.8 uh, microfarad. Uh, time, time. Oh, seconds. Seconds, yeah. Capacitance is measured in farads, time is measured in seconds. So our answer here should calculate to be 448.8 micro yep. seconds. There we go. <laughs> All right. So 448.8 microseconds. I was about to say something that my eyeballs were reading differently, but uh, that's my dyslexia creeping up on me. All right. So do we have the time for one time constant? Yes. And your job in the exercise is to calculate how long does it take for this capacitor to reach full charge? One time constant is this long. How many time constants does it take for a cap to reach full charge? It takes five time constants. So if you recall, 
if you recall, on your time constant graph, capacitor works this way, one, two, three, four, five. So zero tau, zero tau, one tau, two tau, three tau, four tau, five tau. And so this is time in units of seconds or in units of tau. And then this here would be your voltage max up here. And so you're tasked with trying to determine how this capacitor will charge up to some maximum value. Now we happen to have some very, very nice approximate percentages we can work with. We can work with logarithms, but logarithms are a little tedious. Let's just go ahead and work with some, some percentages. And I give you those percentages here in this table. You can use these approximate percentages right here. And so within the first time constant, the capacitor will charge up to what percent of the value? 63.2%. And in the next time constant, it'll charge up to 86.5, and the next one, 95, next one, 98.2, next one, 99.3. These are all pretty good approximations. If we use the logarithm formula, we'd get maybe a couple digits more accuracy, but this will work for us. And we, we can go ahead and use this. And if you put this in your journals, you can go ahead and use those percentages, okay? All right, so we happen to have on our circuit, and I didn't put in a voltage here, I will put in a voltage. Uh, I'm gonna put in 12 volts. I'm gonna put in 12 volts. On your circuit, you've got five, but on this one, I'm gonna put in 12. So what's different about the circuit in our example for this exercise is I give you a color code. I didn't give you an ohmic value. I tell you the color code is at maximum. So you had to determine, interpret the color code, its tolerance times a maximum factor to determine what the value of R is. Then I also did not give you a capacitor value. I gave you a code number for the capacitor. You had to decode that capacitor value. So if you follow our rules, for decoding a cap, you have a first digit, first value, second digit, second value. So we were able to determine first digit was a three, second digit was a four. What does the third digit tell us? Number of zeros. And how many zeros according to this? Four zeros. And we had to follow this with a very specific unit of farads. What is that specific unit of farads? Always will be picofarads, which is 10 negative 12. When you punch this into your calculator, you determine that the capacitor value works out to be 340 nanofarads, which is the same as 0.34 micro. Then you're asked to calculate time constant, tau, TAU, and the formula for tau is R times C. So you pop in your calculator the value of R, the value of C, in full keystroke sequence, and you determine the tau is 448.8 microseconds. What that relates to graphically, my friends, is this. From here to here is 448.8 microseconds. And it takes, it's said that capacitors take how many tau in order to reach the full charge? Full charge will happen at five tau. So how can I find the total time? Can I just take this and multiply it times one, two, three, four, five times? Would that make sense? Is that all right? Let's go ahead and do that. So we turn on our calculators again, and we have the number that's previously in our calculator, and I'm simply gonna multiply times five. So can, uh, Jackie, do you have this number for me? Two point four four milliseconds. And I concur that it's two point four four milliseconds. So the total time, total time of five tau is equal to two point forty uh, two point twenty four. My dyslexia, sorry, two point twenty four microseconds. Is everybody okay with that calculation? Milliseconds. Milliseconds, you're right, thank you. 
milliseconds. That's horrible. Milliseconds there. All right, 2.24 milliseconds. Now, the, the next thing that we're tasked with is, well, how much will the voltage be at various points going up the graph? Well, I submit to you the easiest thing to do here is I will go on Excel and show you how to punch this up in Excel. And I'm going to uh, go to a different screen here. Let's see, somebody's on the chat. Uh, well, thank you, Sarah. Fantastic. I saw the third, uh, 1320. Um, okay, so let's go to Excel and open this guy up. Here, like this. Okay, is that big enough for everybody? All right, so I will have tau, T-A-U, and I will have time, and I will have um, percent voltage, oops, percent, percent voltage, and I'm gonna have percent current. Did it again, percent current, cool. And so we'll start off with, and we'll do this center, center. All right, we will have zero, one, two, three, four, five, because we have starting point of zero, then we have one tau, two tau, three tau, four tau, five tau. And the time was equal to R times C, yes? And we calculated the time uh, to be in this case 448. Okay, that doesn't matter right now. Uh, did I ask you to do the calculation of time? Time in tau, yeah, will be r times c in milliseconds. So, yes, in this case, well, let's go ahead and type in the percentages. The percentages according to the table that I had given to you. And let me format these guys in percentage percent. And let's give this uh, increase to, to two. So we'll start with a zero, enter, zero percent. And then we have a 63.2 percent. And then we have an 86.5 percent. Then we have a 95 percent. Oops, come back here. 95 percent. Then we have a 98.2%, and then we have 99.3%. These percentages also come out of your textbook. They're standardized in the industry, so they're givens, okay? Now, what we have over here will be the percentages that are given by the textbook. Again, we start off with 100%, and then we drop down to 36.8%, and then we drop down to 13.5%, then we drop down to 5%, then we drop down to 1.8, and then we drop down to 0.7%. Yep. Point 0.7, enter. Okay. The zero point zero zero seven, and that didn't make it seven. Okay, zero. Oh, actually, I want a point seventy percent. So I mean, there we go. Okay, so point seven percent. So that's what's given to us that you can use. So let me just go ahead and grid this guy. And that's right off the top of your sheet. Now, what you're asked to calculate happens to be the time in, uh, so let's go ahead and do this. You're asked to calculate time in milliseconds. You're asked to calculate voltage in V and current and comma milliamps. And I think if you do things this way, 
you won't get stuck with uh, having to deal with odd decimal numbers, okay? Trust me on this. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and grid this guy as well. All right. Now I'm going to let you see the full sheet and bring this down and good. All right. Now to do the time, very simply, the time was how many milliseconds? Uh, 448.8. So uh, time in in microseconds. So it was 448.8. And we've already stated that this is in microseconds. So we will do it this way. Uh, we will do equals sum open parentheses. This times this and close parentheses. I'm constructing a formula. And the formula is starts off uh, this construct for, for Excel is pretty standard. You type an equal sign, you type the word sum, you open parentheses. And then what I did here is I click the cell that I want to multiply by, I just simply click it. And the address for that cell is A2. Hit the asterisk for multiply and type 448.8, because that's my time in one, in, in one time constant. That's the basic formula. I hit enter. I'm going to get a zero because zero times anything is zero. But here's the beauty. If I click on the cell, can you see I don't have zero in that this is the um, uh, the address is B2, column B, row two. And the data that's in the cell is not just zero. The data in the cell is a formula equals sum open parentheses A2 uh, times 448.8, close parentheses. And what's beautiful about this is all I need to do is type the formula in once. If I move my Excel over here to this little square at the lower right-hand corner of that cell, the cursor changes from a white cross to a little black cross. The little black cross allows me to copy the formula. Watch carefully. I'm going to click and hold my mouse and drag down. And what this does, it copies the formula and fills this in automatically. You can do the calculation manually. It will work out just fine because didn't we calculate, didn't we calculate our total time to be 2.24 milliseconds? And this is 2.24 milliseconds. 2,244 microseconds is 2.24 milliseconds. You can review the uh, uh, the video uh, that I, I will be posting, uh, so you can practice this. And if you have any questions on how to construct that, those formulas, it's, it's pretty easy to do. Uh, and so, time in milliseconds is actually this will be in microseconds there and i'm just going to copy this data actually over to here because this is where the calculations should have been oops okay getting copy over so i will just reconstruct it no big deal so this will be uh, double click and instead of e2 i'm going to make a2 enter and now if I copy, okay, so all my data is the same. Now, voltages, another very easy calculation if you let Excel do the work for you. Could we calculate these manually? Sure you could. You need to find the voltage at, at, at zero tau. The voltage at zero is going to be your, what did we say, 12 volts? 12 times your, um, 12 times your percentage. 12 times your, let me 
click back in here so I don't erase what's gone. 12 times the percent. That's what you need to do. 12 volts time. I don't know, let me do this. 12 volts times the percentage. Do you have a percentage in this column for voltage? Right here is a column for voltage, yeah? And so all you have to do is to multiply each one of these times 12, and then you'll get it. You can do this manually on your calculator. So what is, okay, so let's say you wanted to fill in this cell. How much voltage will there be at zero percentage of voltage, zero times 12? What, what's gonna be zero times 12? What's zero times anything? Think about it. It's gonna be a donut, yes? Zero times anything is gonna be a zero. How do I construct that in terms of a formula? Watch how I do this. How do we construct formulas in Excel? We start off with what symbol? Equal sign. Can you see the equal sign? Okay. And how else do I uh, construct my formula? I have to do the word sum because that structures a, a, a formula, even though we're not adding. Then I have to open parentheses, yes? Now, I'm going to multiply two things. What am I multiplying? I'm multiplying a percentage times 12, yes? Where do I get the percentage from? Watch my mouse. Can I just click on cell C2? Can you find C2 on my spreadsheet? Point to C2 on your screen. The intersection between C and 2. And it is this one here, yes? If I click on it, what happens in the cell where I was constructing my formula? Do you see C2 appear automatically? Is it in blue? Is the cell that I clicked shaded in blue with a blue marquee flashing? Yeah. Then what do I need to do with that percentage? I have to hit the multiply key, which is asterisk. There's the asterisk. And then what am I multiplying by? How many volts? 12. And now I can just hit enter. And it's a zero because zero times anything is a zero. Let me look at the formula that's in the cell. There's another way to look at the formula. Another way to look at the formula is double click this cell. If I double click it, does the formula reappear? Equals sum C2 times 12, close parentheses, it appears. Now, how do I copy a formula? What did I tell you before? You take your mouse, white cross, move it over to this little square dot on the here. It becomes a black cross, click and drag down. Wow, there you go. Was that fast? That's fast. The magic isn't over yet. Uh, current. What do we do with current? Well, you have to determine the maximum current on this circuit. And so the maximum current on this particular circuit, well, we have to go back to the circuit. So let me stop this show for just a moment. And we're back on the camera. Can everybody see my camera? And on the camera, we started off with 12 volts. And this thing will charge up to 12 volts. And when it charges up to 12, well, what was the what was the ohms on this guy? The ohms on this guy was 1.32k ohms. Huh. 1.32 kilo ohms. The maximum current that can flow is going to be calculated by Ohm's law. If you remember our friend Ohm's law, V I R, if I want current. What do I need to do? Cover up the I, and that's going to be equal to what's left. V divided by R, yes? Do, do I have a V of 12 volts? Do I have an R of 1.32 K ohms? Can you calculate that current, please? 12. 12 divided by 1.32 K and equals. And that calculation, Wei Ji, do you have that number for us, please? 9.1 milliamps. It's going to be 9.1 or 9.09 .9 milliamps. Remember, we're rounding to two digits after the decimal point. So class, Robert, what do you have? Yeah, so it would be 9.09. .09. 
Because if, yeah. if the other zero byte would have been like over five, it would have been one, but it's a zero. Yeah, so so we should agree that it should be 9.0, .9 milliamps, not 9.1. All right, so our maximum current, our IT, IMAX, it can't get any higher than this, is 9.09 .09 milliamps. So knowing that, we now have a maximum current, we will come back to our Excel. So go back to share. And we want to go to here and share. Okay, so our IMAX, and we're not talking about the theater, our IMAX 9.09 .09 milliamps. That's our maximum current. Make this a little wider so everything fits nicely. Now we have a target current. So how do I construct this guy? If current is supposed to be in these percentages shown in this column, could I construct my formula the same way? It's simply this current times this percentage. Okay, so this will be, uh, in this case, start off with equals, right? And then sum, and then open parentheses. And now I'm gonna click which intersection, what's the address of the cell that I want to click on to start this formula? Where is my current percentage? Somebody tell me the intersection of that cell. The D2. D2, very good, I heard several of you. Yes, it's D2. So when I click on D2, D2 appears, whoops, no, I only want D2, hello. Back up, back up, back up. So I only want D2, and then I hit multiply. Whoops, too fast. Click. So equals some open parentheses, D2, and then hit times, and then 9.09. .09. I don't have to key in milli into Excel because the top of my header says it's all in milliamps. And then close parentheses or not close, doesn't matter. Just hit enter. And I wanna change the format of these guys to not be in percentage. So, hello, it should appear. Yes, I want a number, two digits, okay. So 9.09 .09 milliamps, I have a good formula. Double check the formula, equals sum D2 times 9.09. .09. That's a great formula. How do I copy this formula? Click and it fills in. Is that fast? Very, very fast. Let Excel or your spreadsheet do the work for you. This is called working smarter, not harder. You can do all of this manually but I'm showing you a different way of doing things. Now, you are also asked to graph your values, yeah? And Excel does a really, really nice job of graphing things for you. Uh, so we can have time in microseconds. So this would be uh, TAU equals time in microseconds. So that's the title of that. So let me widen this a little bit more. All right, so the information we want, watch how, watch how fast Excel will do a chart for you. I'm gonna select from here, click and drag all the way to here. I want all this information. I need the titles at the top of these columns. I need all these values for time, voltage, and uh, milliamps. And I am going to do insert. I'm gonna do recommended chart. And I want a line chart and hit OK. Boom. Is that cool or what? Now, we're not done yet. We can select a specific kind that might have information. Oh, look at this one. This one's kind of cool. It's got some nice shading and it shows you the values in between. This one shows you no values, but it's shaded. This one shows you grid lines horizontally. This one shows you 
grid lines horizontally and vertically. This one is, oh wow, black, that's pretty contrasty. This one is another one that shows uh, values in between. I kind of like this one. Kind of like this one. It's got, uh, nah, the white lettering is hard to read. So maybe, yeah, this one's a little easier to read. So I select this one and the chart title here, you can name the chart title, rename this, and this will be your RC time constants by your name. Cool. I'm going to use I'm a sample. She's a good friend of mine. And so let me move this, move my magnification off just a touch so you can see more of the spreadsheet. So yeah, there is all your information, my friends. You typed in these percentages, you were able to calculate the time in microseconds, you were able to uh, calculate the voltages, calculate the currents, and take the data, plot it, and it gives you a really nice plot. And doesn't this look a lot like uh, our lecture on Monday with the voltages charging slowly up to a maximum and then the current starting at maximum and coming down to a minimum, okay? So, Mr. Ko? My dear. You don't want us to fill out the chart that is in the document that we download. Oh, let me show. That's a really good question. I love the questions that you ask because they're very intuitive. Let me show you what I would recommend for you to do. Because you did such nice work. And those of you who choose to try this in Excel, and I encourage you to stretch yourselves, because it's a fast exercise. It probably took me three times as long to do it because I'm explaining what I'm doing along the way. Uh, but because some of you will take uh, the opportunity to do this, watch what is going to happen with your exercise. So I have an exercise right here. Du -dum, du -dum, du -dum. And I'm going to change my share because everybody has now seen the Excel. Yes, I'm going to go back to the Word document and show you what you can do with the Word document for your homework. Bum, 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 bum. Okay, so there's the Word document. So let me change my share. Stop share. And let me do a new share. Bum, 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 bum. And let's take a look at the Word document and share. Bingo. Can everybody see the uh, Word document? That is your homework. Normally, you would pull out a pen and calculator and you would calculate all the values to fill in this chart. Yeah? Well, I tell you, if you have done a chart in Excel, I can click on this chart, click this little plus cross arrow box in this corner right here, select it so the whole table is selected and backspace. Boom, it's now gone. And I'm going to come over to my Excel and select those cells, copy, and click in here. Watch the magic. Paste. Ooh. We just did that in Excel. Because you did it in Excel, we'll just paste, copy, and paste it. It's your work. And this, this um, graph down here, well, if you can plot this in paper and pen, that's perfectly okay. And it will take you a few minutes to do so, but I'm gonna get rid of that. And I'm gonna go over to my Excel, grab my, my created uh, chart, copy, and come over here, click, and paste. Now it's a little larger, so I'm gonna resize this just a touch so it fits. Boom. That is how I would recommend you uh, turning in your work. Now, this in this particular case, we should type in, what did we calculate the time to be was 448.8 microseconds, so 448.8 US. And then what we ought to do for all of our answers is 
just makes it easier for me to see. Bold yellow highlight, thank you, I really appreciate that. And then the total time that we calculated was a two point, I had it here, you know, 2.24 milliseconds, so 2.24 ms. And again, select it and bold it and highlight it, boom turn that in with your name on it, well, your chart should have your name on it. In this case, this is submitted by I'm a sample. And that's your homework. So this is how I would recommend that you, one way you could turn in your assignment. Is this, this answer your question, Jackie? That's a good question. Yes, thank you. Yeah. yeah, saves you the tedium of having to copy numbers over on a piece of paper or typing them over. You've already generated them on your spreadsheet. So just copy the chunk of the spreadsheet, paste it, copy the chart, paste it. You're done. This exercise is done. Okay. So review the uh, video forthcoming on this. Uh, if you want to embrace Excel, I, like I say, I do encourage you to think to do so. Um, it is a wonderful time saver and it gives you really, really great, uh, very professional looking results. All right, let me go ahead and file. Save this guy as browse and let me put this into 50. Okay, it's already in 50. Uh, and this will be exercises one, and this will be uh, example E X A M P L E with Excel with with Excel. There, I can save that for the next batch of uh, students. Cool. All right, that takes care of that guy, and we will stop the sharing, and that takes care of answering that. And deal. Now, another exercise that we were playing with, oh yeah, your circuit building. Yeah, you had this wonderful circuit that you had to build. So can you, everybody see my camera? And on the camera, you can see the circuit build K, okay? And circuit build K, I didn't show you a picture of how that should be built. I'm kind of hoping that you all have a confidence level of how to build this on your own. If you don't have a confidence level of how to build it on your own. I did build one for you, and uh, here it is. This is this, and I can bring this closer, right to here. There we go, cool. So what you have going on in this circuit is you've got an R2 and an R3, 1K ohm, What's their relationship with each other? Parallel. And have I connected them in parallel with each other, connected at the top and also connected at the bottom on the blue rail? In fact, this blue rail right here is the ground side of your source. Notice I have the source buried in the middle of the circuit. It's no longer on the left side, no longer on the right side. This is something different. And so, I happen to have uh, next to the parallel a 1k ohm resistor. So here at the top of the parallel, I have 1k ohm resistor, a little jumper wire, and then this then connects to the positive side of your 5 volt source. And that connects to the positive side of your 5 volt source. So this uh, jumper is set to 5 volts. This jumper is set to the off position. Okay, make sure this is off. This should not be set to 5. Then you have on this side R4, R5, and R6, and they are connected from the top of the voltage source all the way to the bottom of the voltage source. So from here, can you see a path of three resistors in series with each other going all the way down to the bottom of the voltage source? Are we okay with this? Now, your circuits don't have to look like this, but I thought I'd give you a, a guide to uh, one way of building this, and I tried to build this to visually appear as close to um, the drawn circuit as much as possible. And so when you're ready to do your measurements, you have to do all your calculations first, but when you're ready to do your measurements, you plug in your power, power is on, and then we want to confirm that we happen to have the correct amount of voltage on the board. So focus again, move this slightly over this way. 
bring in my digital multimeter, turn it on, DC volts, and we want to confirm that we do in fact have from the positive rail, from the positive rail up here, nope, to the negative rail down here, our full five volts DC, which we do. All right. So your task is after you after you do the calculations, then you go to make the measurements. What do you have for voltages along the way? And keep in mind your red probe will always be on the more positive side of the component. So if I'm going to measure R4, my red probe is going to be on this side of R4, black probe here, red probe here, black probe here for R5, and for R6 would be measured in this fashion. Uh, for the R for R1, I'm going to flip this around. My red probe has to be on this side because this is the more positive side of the circuit. Black probe on here to measure VR1. VR2 and 3 are positive on top and negative on the bottom. I'm not going to make these measurements for you because you have to do this on your own. How do I measure current? The current for R1, I can pull this jumper, yeah? And I can measure between here and here for current. So if I yank this jumper for just a moment, I should be able to switch the leads, go to microamps, switch this, go to uh, this will all probably all be a milliamps rather, and then go to hook up, and I should be able to get a current of some value in milliamps. Okay, so that's how I would measure that current, and then if I want to measure the current for R2, I yank that yellow jumper. If I want to measure the current for R3, yank that jumper. If I want to measure the current on these three series resistors, all I have to do is yank that yellow jumper there because that gives us the current for all three of these resistors that are in series. So the exercise is fairly, um, I would like to say simple, uh, as long as you have confidence and we hope you have confidence in making your voltage and current measurements. So what are the deliverables? The deliverables on this say, let me set, turn this off, unplug, turn this off and unplug this, get it out of the way. The deliverables are right here. You want to take uh, complete all calculations of all voltages and currents. You need to complete your own measurements of all voltages and currents using your own power supply and digital multimeter. So we're not doing any of this in class. You will bring the circuit into class so that I can see the so that I can see the uh, finished circuit. Uh, hi, Nabil. I'm in class presently. Over. And. Um, then you're going to take selfie photos and so your selfie photos will be of you measuring your ir1 ir2 ir3 and ir5 for a total of five selfie photos uh, and, and in one ms word document each photo half page large okay don't give me a photo on your page that is that small i need the photos to be like half the size of the page so i can see that you have your ammeter hooked up properly, that the value of the current is correct for that particular resistor that you're measuring, and put your ID card somewhere on the side of your breadboard so that I know that it is you. Okay? Okay. So any questions about what the what the deliverables are for this exercise? Okay. All right. So that takes care of that exercise. And we also did the RC time constant exercise. Nice, cool. Now we happen to have some Pythagorean theorem exercises. Uh, we had a filter exercise. Oh, yeah, the filter exercise. Our filter exercise, I'll give you a clue. Page 608 to 619 in your textbook. So 608 to 619 in your textbook is the section on filters. And 608 to 619. So we start off, uh, this is high up. 
All right, so there's a discussion on low pass filters. There's a discussion of, uh, they show you the graph of the low pass filter. They show you one method of building a low pass filter. They show you another method of building a low pass filter. So you happen to have uh, this arrangement, you have this arrangement. Now, the, then there's also discussion on high pass filters and some sample circuits of how that works. So your task is to identify what these filter types are. You say, this is a blank, blank filter. That's a blank, blank filter, blank, 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 blank. And then what you need to do on the paper is you need to draw a simple, how many device? Two device circuit before the load that represents filter A. And then there's, there's two different examples that are shown in your textbook, uh, one that has a capacitor and one that has a coil. Then down here, you're supposed to draw two separate circuit, two additional circuits that represent circuit B filter. This, this is circuit B filter, and that's also in your textbook. You can just copy it from the textbook. Two devices before the load. So you draw it in here and you draw it in here. And that completes this exercise. This is like a six, seven minute exercise, not very lengthy, but it's an important exercise because we build on this, okay? So refer to those pages in your textbook, you will not get lost. Any questions about that exercise? Okay. Then we happen to have, oh yeah, these are my answers, sorry. <laughs> Let's take a look at Pythagorean theorem. All right. So, uh, Pythagorean theorem, let's bring this down to here, close this guy up, bring something back into focus so I can focus. That's good. All right. So, our friend Pythagoras came up with a theorem with respect to right triangles, and a right triangle is anything Pythagorean theorem. In Pythagorean theorem, you might recall a squared plus b squared equals c squared, yes? This is a very famous equation that pertains to this. And basically, one of the sides, one of the short sides is it called a, one of the other short sides is is called B, and typically C is the longest side, which is the hypotenuse. And so he came up with this relationship between these sides, as long as it is a right triangle. What makes a right triangle? That there's a little box in one corner, and this designates that we have a corner that is how many degrees? 90 degrees. So this is only for right triangles. This is not a geometry class. We will not play with other types of triangles. We will not get into the law of cosines, law of sine. Nothing like that. This is much simpler. So what he discovered was whatever we have A, whatever length A is, if we go to square it and then we have B and we go to square it, the area of these two guys combined is equal to C squared. It's a very interesting relationship that he came about some night just looking at the stars. So your task is to do this. If you were shown a triangle like so, and if you are shown that uh, we have this is 17 meters and this is 22 meters, then your hypotenuse, which I will abbreviate HYP, is equal to question mark. How do we calculate this missing side of the triangle if we know Pythagorean theorem formula? Well, we can pop things in here. We can, if we're looking for this side, it's typically going to be C. We can rearrange all of this. Isn't C squared equal to A squared plus B squared? Isn't that true? If I just flip it around? Yes. And I don't want C squared. I want C. So isn't C equal to the square root of A squared plus B squared? That also is true. So what do we need to do on our calculators? What we need to do in our calculators is this. C is equal to the square root of 
17 squared plus 22 squared. That's what we need to key into our calculator. Now, how is that done in our calculators? Given your calculators, I believe you should hit the square root key. If the square root key is not immediately followed by an open parentheses, I would encourage us to do open parentheses. And then you take the first value and then you square it. There's a square function. And then you do an add. Then you have a second value. 22 is the second value. What do you need to do there? You need to square it. And then you need to close your parentheses. Then you hit equals. Can you do that keystroke sequence on your calculators right now? I'll be back in just a moment. Yep, it's as I suspected on your wonderful calculators. It doesn't start with generating open parentheses. It would be helpful if you put it in. Okay, let's go ahead and do this. According to the keystroke sequence, I have our calculator and hit the square root, open parentheses, take 17 and hit my square key. And I'm going to add that to 22 and hit the square key and close parentheses. And when I hit equals, Brad, what do you have? I have 27.80. 27.80. And that's if I put this in engineering. Yes, I concur. 27.80. And so hypotenuse is equal to 27.80. Now, what units were given on this triangle? Meters, yes? So these were meters, then I have to write what on the end of this? Lowercase m for meters, all right? Everybody okay with solving a hypotenuse given two sides? We'll give you another example, and another example will be this. So suppose I have a triangle here. And then I say that this is equal to 180 omegas. Let's say this one is equal to 79 omegas. And the hypotenuse is equal to question mark. So how do I structure my keystroke sequence based on looking for the value of the hypotenuse? So the value of the hypotenuse is like C, and that's equal to the square root of A squared plus B squared, yes? And therefore, the hypotenuse in this particular case is the square root of 180 squared plus 79 squared. And therefore, the hypotenuse works out to be, and let's go ahead and do that on our calculators. We said square root, open parentheses just once, 180 squared plus 79 squared, close parentheses. And Robert, what do you calculate on this? I'm calculating it right now. Okay. And uh, Jacqueline, what do you calculate? 196.57. And Almost. I concur 196.57 omegas, yes? 196.57 ohms. Everybody okay with that calculation? Okay. Now, we're going to do something a little different. We're going to do something where the hypotenuse is given and you're looking for a missing side. So, for example, if I have something like this and I say that the hypotenuse is equal to 2 kilo ohms and I have this one as 1.5 kilo ohms. What is the length of this side? Well, if you remember that C is always going to be the hypotenuse and it doesn't matter what these are, A, B, your equation was A squared plus B squared equals C squared. We're looking for B. 
how do I how do I keep B on one side of the equation? What do I need to do with the A squared? What do I how do I move it to the other side? Doesn't this become B squared is equal to C squared minus A squared? Because these are added. And if I wanted to move the A squared to the other side, don't I subtract it from the other side? That's just basic transposing, okay? Where I'm moving the A squared to the other side of the equation. What's that leave me with on the uh, left-hand side? It leaves me with B squared, which is what I want. Now, do I really want B squared or do I really want B? I want B. So B is equal to, so how do I get rid of the square on this side? I get rid of the square on this side by putting the whole thing on the other side under square root. There you are. So any short side, any short side will always be what? The hypotenuse squared minus the other short side. Did you hear that? If I'm looking for any, if I'm looking for any hypotenuse, it will always be a squared plus b squared. There's a plus in here. If I'm looking for any short side, if I'm given the hypotenuse, I'm looking for one of the shorter sides, it will always be hypotenuse squared minus the other short side. Let me write out exactly what I'm saying. Hypotenuse squared minus whatever other short side that will be equal to b. Let's pop in these numbers. So in this case, b is equal to the square root of hypotenuse will be 2k squared minus, keep in mind that's a minus here, 1.5k, 1.5k squared. Now, the keystroke sequence for this is going to look like the following. Square root, key, open parentheses, 2, exp, 3, isn't that 2 kilo? We're not afraid of kilos. We're not afraid of any numbers that go in here. Just hit the exponent and the appropriate power of 10. And what do we do with this first value? We have to square it. So x squared. Then what do we do? Are we adding? No. If we're looking for a short side, the math here has to be subtract. What am I subtracting? The other number. So 1.5 exponent 3. What do I need to do here? Square it. Then followed by close parentheses. This is where a lot of students forget. They get so excited about hitting 1.5 exponent 3 x squared. Boom, they forget to close parentheses. You have to close parentheses, then you hit equals. If you do this keystroke sequence right now, and I will do this as you do it right now. Right now means now, not when I ask you for the answer. So square root, open parentheses, 2 exponent 3 minus 1.5 exponent 3, close parentheses, and I'm about to hit the equal button. So, Sarah, squares. do you have the value for me? Mr. Co, you I'm forgot sorry, your squares. Did I, I did, didn't I? I got so excited. Ah, square root, open parentheses, 2 exponent 3, squared, subtract, 1.5 exponent 3, squared, now closed parentheses. See what happens when you get so excited. Thank you. And before I hit my equal sign, Sarah, do you happen to have a value for us? Oh, we has got a number. Sarah's got a number. That was milliamps. We're looking for. I'm not sure if Sarah's still with us. Brad, do you have a number for us? Yeah, I have. Um... 22.36. Okay. And works out to be. And what did you get there, Weej? 1322.88. Yeah, and if you hit engineering key, what do you have? 1.32k. Exactly. Everybody see the display on my calculator? 1.32K. So it works out 
to be 1.32k ohms would be the answer. So this equals 1.32k ohms is the answer there. All right. So it always has to be less than your hypotenuse. It can never calculate to be anything greater than the hypotenuse. So we have to remember this is a subtract. Very easy to do. Let's do this again. Clear the calculator. Follow the keystrokes. Square root, open parentheses, two, exponent three, hit the square key. I forgot to hit the square key last time, sorry. Then I'm going to have to hit a subtract, subtract. Then the 1.5, exponent three, square it, close parentheses, equals, and there, there's your answer that we had discussed before, 1.3 two kilo ohms okay okay so practice that particular calculation and you should be okay with it if you have any other questions contact me or contact each other and practice these guys but that's how you calculate a, a um, short side let's give you one more and then we'll talk about Sokotoa so let's do another one here and let's say I have this guy here and let's say this one is equal to 1780 ohms and let's say this one's equal to 1450 ohms and this one's equal to question mark of a right triangle so the first thing you got to realize are we calculating for hypotenuse or are we calculating for short side short side either one of these is a short side so what formula do you use for a short short side, it will be b is equal to square root c squared minus a squared, okay? Pop in the values, b is equal to, now what's c? c, your hypotenuse, is going to be 17, 8, 0 squared, and it's going to be minus the other side, which is 1450 squared. How do you put this into your calculator? It will be square root, open parentheses, 1780 squared. And in this case, because we're looking for one of the short sides, we have to use a minus, subtract. Then you key in your second value, 1450, square then close parentheses, then equals. Do that calculation. And as you do this calculation, clear. We have square root. We have open parentheses, 1780 squared, subtract 1450 squared, close parentheses. And the answer here, Robert, what do you got? 1.03 kilo ohms. And uh, yes, I would concur. My calculator also shows 1.03 kilo ohms. Is everybody okay with that exercise? Okay. Now, on to some more interesting stuff, and that is Sokatoa. And Sokotoa, uh, from the Monday video, and I've got several other videos on Sokotoa that you can refer to. Sokotoa is a memory tool. It's a mnemonic. And it tells you a very interesting relationship between different parts of a triangle. So bef uh, let's go ahead and define what the, these three letters of these three phrases mean. S-O-H means this, the sine of an angle, and we'll call theta, we'll use the Greek letter, theta is, an off, is an often used Greek letter for, uh, for um, um, values, the sine of an angle theta is equal to something over something, and it's equal to what we call opposite over hypotenuse, that's an abbreviation. 
So if you look at this, let me get my highlighter. You see the three letters that make up SOH? You see the S over here? Is there an S in sign? Do you see the O for the second letter? And the O is the very first letter of the word opposite. Do you see the H here? And the H is the very first letter of hypotenuse. So SOH so tells you, gives you a clue what function, which side of the triangle is numerator, which side of the triangle is your denominator. If we take a look at the next one, CAH, CA is the next one. That is your cosine of angle theta is equal to, now A would stand for adjacent, so ADJ over hypotenuse. So here we have C as the first letter for CA. We have C for what math function? Cosine. We have A as the second letter in CA, and that stands for adjacent in the numerator. And you have an H as the last letter in the word CA, and that stands for hypotenuse in the denominator. Then you happen to have TOA, T-O-A. TOA stands for the tangent of angle theta is equal to opposite over adjacent. And I'm using three letter uh, characterizations for, to abbreviate. So OPP stands for opposite. And ADJ stands for adjacent. And HYP stands for uh, hypotenuse. And so for the very first, last phrase, TOA, you have a T, and the T represents this math function, T for tangent. The O is opposite, and that's the very first letter of your numerator. And the A for the last letter of TOA stands for A for adjacent, which is your last letter, uh, first letter for um, your denominator. So we use Soka Toa as a memory tool. Mnemonic is a memory tool. And the memory tool in this case helps us understand what these relationships are based on the terminologies which I'm gonna show you on a triangle. So if I draw a triangle and that's the corner and I'm gonna give you angle theta so here is angle theta. I'm going to put this up here. Can you name the three sides of this triangle? So I'll, arbitrarily, I'm going to call this one A, B, and C. So you happen to have side B, C. Side B, C has a name. What do we call the side that is labeled B, C? Hypotenuse. Brad. Oh, Jackie, thank you. It's called the hypotenuse, yes? How do I know that's called the hypotenuse? Two reasons. One reason, isn't this the longest side of a right triangle? Hypotenuse equals longest side of right triangle. Hypotenuse also equals the side opposite the right angle. And that's a symbol for an angle. So the hypotenuse is, is, the, is defined two ways. It's the longest side of a right triangle. It is also opposite the right angle. So hypotenuse is from B to C. Fine. What do you call side AC? AC is here. And so there's a very special name given to side AC because because of where the, the angle of theta is. Here's A to C, and here is the hypotenuse. If I put theta in that corner, 
Doesn't side AC help to form the angle of theta? Yeah? So because it helps to form the angle of theta, side AC has a name, and it is called adjacent, which we abbreviate as ADJ, and you've seen that abbreviated up here. It's called adjacent, why? Because it helps to form angle theta. That's why it's called adjacent. It makes up the other half of the angle for theta. So what's left in here? What's left is side A to B. Side A to B has a name. It is abbreviated as OPP. OPP stands for what? Opposite. What is it opposite of? This is opposite angle theta. That's why this side is it's called opposite. So are we, are, uh, are we in agreement that this is my HYP, this is my ADJ, and this is my opposite? So far, so good? Okay, that all depends on where theta is. This is all new. That's okay. And let's go and show you another example. Let's say I draw you this. here and here, and let's go A, B, C. So I'm gonna write down hypotenuse equals side blank. OPP equals side blank. ADJ equals side blank. And I've given theta right here. So given this exercise, you have to name the sides, given the letters of these length of lines. So, Brad, hypotenuse is which side? Uh, hypotenuse is AC. Hypotenuse is AC. How many people agree hypotenuse is AC? Raise your hands. Good. All right. Excellent. Uh, so this is hypotenuse. It's the longest side. And it's also opposite the right angle, yes? Good. Now, how about the opposite side? The opposite side, Jackie, what would be the opposite side? Opposite side is AB. How many people agree opposite side is AB? AB, very good. So this is called opposite because the angle theta is here and that's directly on the other side of the triangle. Then what's left is here, is the adjacent B to C, is that true? Why is B to C called adjacent? How do we verbalize that? Wei Ji, how do we justify adjacent is B, C? Just because it's left over? Because it helps to form the angle of theta. Yes, it helps to form the angle of theta. Right here is the angle of theta, and it always takes two sides to form the angle. One will be the hypotenuse, the other one has to be the adjacent. So this other side that helps to form is going to be adjacent, okay? Now, do each of these sides have a first letter? Opposite starts with what letter? I have an O, right? Hypotenuse starts with what letter? H. And adjacent starts with what letter? A. So here's the beauty of Sokotoa. Sokotoa works incredibly well this way. If I were to tell you, if I were to tell you, opposite is 20 ohms. And I were to tell you that angle theta, angle theta right here, angle theta is equal to, let's say, 25 degrees. I give you two facts. Facts. Opposite equals 20 ohms. Angle theta equals 25 degrees. 
your task, your task is to find, number one, find hypotenuse, question mark. So this is a little different than Pythagorean theorem. In Pythagorean theorem, what did we do? We were given two sides and you had to calculate a missing side. This is infinitely more interesting, and this one pertains to electronics, actually. So how do I find hypotenuse? Here's the clue. Here's the clue. If I'm looking for hypotenuse, does hi the, the word hypotenuse start with a letter? What is the letter for hypotenuse? H. Is there one other side that is given a value? Am I given a value for hypotenuse? No, I'm looking for it. Am I given a value for adjacent? No, I'm going to look for that in a moment. Which side has a given value? Opposite has a given value of what? 20 ohms, yes? Opposite starts with what letter? O. Oh. So check this out. You're looking for an H. You are given an O. Did you see this? You're looking for an H and you're given an O. So think back. So ka toa, which of these three has an H and an O? So. No, the very first one, not the last one. If you look at toa, that has no, it has an O, but it has no H. If you look at ka, that has an H, but it doesn't have an O. So has an H and an O. That's your clue. So to find hypotenuse, you will use SOH. Isn't that interesting? That's how you determine which one of these to use. Once you determine what to use, then the formulas are here. So, so says the sine of angle theta is equal to opposite over hypotenuse. Yes, opposite over hypotenuse. That equation came from here. How do we know to use sine? How do we know to use so? Well, we looked at the first letters and determined so. All right. What are we looking for here? Uh, let's fill this in. So sine, and I'm going to abbreviate, sine is just simply S-I-N, of the angle of, uh, what, what angle do I have here? 25 degrees is equal to 20 over hypotenuse, yes? So if I have a value on one side of the equation and I have a fraction on the other side of the equation, how do I find hypotenuse? Hypotenuse moves over this side, this moves over that side. HYP is going to be equal to 20 over sine of 25 degrees. And if I punch this into the calculator, Watch this clue, 20 divided by sine, you have an S-I-N key, of 25 equals, boom, and engineering. So it turns out that the hypotenuse calculates to be 47.32 ohms. Okay, by using this manipulation. So 47 to 32 omegas. We have one more to do in the minute and a half that I have left. Not hard at all. I need to find the adjacent. What am I given? I'm given opposite and I'm looking for adjacent. So if I just redraw this very quickly, my opposite is equal to 20 ohms. My adjacent is my question mark. My angle theta is 25 degrees. What letters do I have? I am looking for adjacent, which is an A. What side am I given? I'm given opposite, which is an O. I have an A and an O. What part of Sokotoa am I going to use? Toa. Toa. T-O-A, we're going to use TOA. And when we use TOA, 
the equation says the tangent angle theta is equal to opposite over adjacent. Again, we have tangent of 25 degrees is equal to 20 over adjacent. If I'm looking for this value in the denominator, these two simply swap positions. So adjacent comes out here and tangent 25 goes down there. They just simply swap. Now I can do this calculation and let's do this calculation. 20 divide by, divide by tangent, hit T-A-N, 25 equals, and we end up with adjacent being 42.89 ohms. Is that correct? And your final check to make sure everything is right. Your final check to make sure everything is right. Here's your triangle. This was, this was given as 20 ohms. You just now calculated this to be 42.89 ohms. You calculated the hypotenuse to be 47.32 ohms. So this was given, this was calculated, and this was calculated. Can we put this back into a Pythagorean theorem equation to see if this squared plus this squared gives us this? Let's see. Hypotenuse equals the square root of a squared plus b squared, yeah? Isn't that equal to the square root of 20 squared plus 42.89 squared? And so mathematically, this is square root, open parentheses, 20 squared plus 42.89 squared, close parentheses, equal. And let's see if all of this works out. Clear, square root, open parentheses, open parentheses, um, 20 squared plus 42.89, 89 squared, close parentheses, equals. The moment I hit equals, hopefully I end up with my 47.32. Let's see if that happens. One, two, three. Engineering, woohoo, 47.32. It works, yes? It works. All right. Uh, that's our time is up for this particular session. I'd like everybody to uh, very quickly turn their cameras back on. I'm going to get off of this, go back to here. You get to smile and take everybody's picture. Isn't that wonderful? Let me go to gallery view, gallery view, yes. And come on. And Sarah, if you're there, give us a smile, yes. One, two, three, everybody, and way, yay. <laughs> That's great. All right, fantastic, everybody. Um, yeah, if there's questions that come up, hit me in Discord. Talk to each other in Discord. You know, just I'd love to see the banter going back and forth. Uh, I wish you guys have a wonderful weekend and have fun circuit building. We'll see you on Monday. Have a great weekend. Have a great, safe Halloweens. <laughs> Take care. Bye-bye now.